made me realize that I wanted to go over there and I wanted to do something for our country. You know, I wanted to do my part. I graduated in 2001, 9-11 was right out of high school. Went home for that day. Our boss, I remember my boss at the time told me that, you know, he said, we're going to war. And that's something that, that's always stuck with me. After that, George Bush declared war on terrorism. And I don't know why, but it struck my interest. It made me realize that I wanted to go over there and I wanted to do something for our country. You know, I wanted to do my part. Um, that's mainly the reason why I joined the military. When I did, go into my recruiter's office. It's like, if somebody's shooting at me, I want to be shooting back. And he goes, you want infantry? I said, okay, that's what I want. Sign me up. The first time I left to go to boot camp, I actually didn't tell any of my family. I wasn't close to my family growing up. Um, I, didn't, I didn't tell them. I told my dad and my mom. It was just, it was kind of weird because it wasn't like everybody gathering around and sending me off. I just kind of went on my own and that was it. Like I didn't even say goodbye or anything like that to anybody. A month before I came to boot camp, I started working out for the first time ever in my life, ever. Like I remember sitting there uh, at night in my bedroom just doing push-ups and sit-ups just trying to get used to it because I didn't know what to expect. I never worked out in my life. In order to pass to go to boot camp, you have to pass a certain amount of, you have to do, you have to run a certain amount of miles in a certain amount of time and do X amount of push-ups, X amount of sit-ups. And um, I did not pass. I was in our, our fat body program so I had to get in shape before I could go to boot camp. I was at Fort Drum for two years. That whole time at Fort Drum, um, we were just training, training nonstop for our deployment. There's a lot of basic fundamentals, battle drills, you know, leadership drills, stuff like that that they train you for. I've only, I only deployed one time. Our first deployment was to um, Afghanistan, Paktika province, that's where we're going. February 2007 is when we deployed. Obviously, this is my first deployment. I'd never deployed. I didn't know what to expect. It still didn't seem real when we stopped at Germany. It still felt like, you know, I was just traveling. As we're getting to C-130, we're heading to Afghanistan, okay? So that's when I'm kind of thinking, okay, well, I don't know what to expect, all right? Is this, is, is this gonna be a, a danger zone? But from what we were told, Bagram Airfield is a pretty well built up safe zone. So, you know, they had some pretty good security there. From Bagram, that's when we knew we were getting, going to the danger zone, okay? Eventually the time came where we got into Chinook. They were there waiting, we had our gear on, we had our weapons, and then we start flying to our FOB, our forward operating base. I don't know if you know who Pat Tillman is. He was a ex-NFL player who gave up everything he had. He gave up millions of dollars to go and fight terrorism. Ultimately, he ended up giving up his life. He was KIA in Afghanistan. The, the base where we were, we were at was named after him, Fob Tillman. That's where we were gonna be stationed at. We've heard things about this place. We knew that we were going into a hot zone. All these things are going through my head. What if we get hit by RPG fire on the way there? What if we come under attack? We start landing. When I get off that Chinook, I have my weapon in my hand and there's mountains all around the area. Okay, the mountains are just high and I remember just looking up and I'm like oh this is it I'm gonna get sniped in the face right here we had a briefing and then we uh, we just kind of started transitioning to being there like that was we were gonna be living at that place for the next year this is when it starts to becoming real all right in the middle of the night I hear people yelling screaming saying get your stuff on get your stuff on what ended up being was incoming mortar fire was landing around our area. Where they thought it was coming from was out in the field, what we call the dashta. We get all our stuff on, you know, we're getting ready to pull security. Our uh, CO tells us, hey, we're going out in the field. We're gonna go check this out. We're gonna see what's going on. We probably have ha had about five or six vehicles in, a, in our convoy. We're driving around there. I'm sitting in the rear, uh, rear con convoy and I'm pulling rear security. I'm in the turret and I have a Mark 19 sitting in front of me. Mark 19s are automatic grenade launchers, you know. Pull the trigger, and it just shoots out grenades nonstop. We're driving out in the field. We're looking for 
anything, anybody out there, anybody we can stop. It's completely dark. We have our night vision goggles. You can't see nothing. It's probably three o'clock in the morning. Next thing I know, I hear it snap, crackle, pop. That's the sound of gunfire. Gunfire coming from all over. And I see just tracers flying past my head. I'm, I'm, I can hear them dinging off the front panel, just hitting everything. My reaction was just to pull the trigger and just start shooting. For some reason, somebody did not put in a pin. As soon as I pull the butterfly trigger, the whole thing kicks back and pops off the turret. The Mark 19 is sitting upside down on the back of our Humvee. And it's just sitting there and I don't have any weapon. I said, I need something. Somebody grabs me some rifles and I just start firing back. We drive out of there as fast as we can and we start heading back to a safer zone. Eventually we head back to base. You know, we roll in, we see the bullet holes in the Humvee. We see the, our, the tires blowing up, the, the bullet holes in, in the windshield. That moment when we got out, that's when it actually became real. I remember getting out and thinking and just trying to breathe. My adrenaline was spiked, you know. It was through the roof and I was saying, holy shit, this is, this is the real deal here. That was first contact for anybody, for our whole platoon, you know, that we're, our whole company that, we're, that was there. That was first contact for all of us. That's when it became real for me. Initially, when we went overseas, we were scheduled to be there for one year, only one year, all right? That's our deployment. We did our tour, we get done. We're all looking forward to coming home. And I remember uh, it was the middle of the night, midnight, everybody's excited, nobody wants to sleep. We're all looking forward to coming home. We start getting, hearing rumors from people talking on their wives on their phone. They come back in and they're saying, my wife just said that we're getting extended. We were there ready to come back the next day to hearing that we have to go back to the war zone for five more months. So we had to, we literally went back after knowing how much contact we had, how much combat we faced in that area, you know. It was definitely hard to swallow. I actually had a girlfriend who um, actually became my fiance while I was deployed overseas. That my mindset was set that when I came back, I was getting out. Uh, I, could not, I could not deal with another deployment for 15 months. Even after, even in that one year that we were scheduled to, to be there, you know, it was just too much. You know, every time we, we drove somewhere, we knew we were getting into a gunfight. Every single time we were out there in our vehicles, you know, past the wire, we didn't know if we were coming back. It was a chance that we all took. We all knew that when we crossed that wire to leave our base, it could be the last time we, we crossed that wire. So when you think about that every single day, when you have that thought processing through your head every single day, you know, it's not really encouraging as, you know, do I want to do this again? Do I want to come back? When I get home, do I want to come back and do this? Coming back from, you know, being out in the military into civilian life, I would say I transitioned okay. Being in the military kind of uh, turns people into alcoholics. I think that was my way of dealing with PTSD as well. I would drink a lot to where I would black out and not remember anything until the next morning. A lot of veterans deal with it, but I was in that situation as well. Throughout the, the next few months, my, my, my wife would say to me, you're not the same, you're not the same, something's different about you. I eventually found, found some help. I talked to the VA and started going to counseling. That still wasn't enough. It, it, it wasn't doing anything for me. I was still drinking a lot. I was talking to somebody, but it, it didn't seem like nobody cared. Actually, through the time that I was going for therapy, I probably seen four different therapists. The only reason I drank was because I had PTSD and I was had a severe case of anxiety. Drinking would help me cope with that as far as calming down. I'd hate being surrounded by people. If I'd walk into a place, I'd, they, my anxiety would take over. I was on medication. Medication wasn't doing nothing for me. Eventually, fitness grew into a passion of mine. I fell in love with it. I used that as my outlet. Working out was my, was my stress reliever, and it also stopped me from just drinking for no reason. My passion for fitness had, 
has grown so much that I decided to open Fire Fitness Camp. You know, this is where I'm at now. Through fitness, I overcame, and now I get to do that to change other people's lives as well. This is why I, I'm doing this project, is to let people know that there is people that are still struggling. I've been out of the military for eight years, and, and then over eight years now, and um, I'm, I'm still telling my story. I'm still dealing with it, you know. It's never gonna be easy. It's gonna be difficult, but even if it helps one person to have them to find the courage to get out there and tell somebody their story, even just to talk about it, to find somebody to talk about their situation, then this whole project would be worth in itself.